Okay, everybody, welcome back to Swedenborg and Life. We're doing our throwback show tonight. And why a throwback show? Well, because we have 122, 23, something like that, videos on this channel. And it's a big representation of a big body of teaching. Because Swedenborg, that this, this channel is based on him. You probably have heard of him by now. He wrote a lot of stuff. There's a lot of concepts in there that tie to a lot of other things which create discussions based on discussions based on discussions. So there's a lot of material. And we want to make sure that you guys didn't miss any of it because if you've just joined the channel recently or haven't watched in a while, there may be some things that you haven't seen, but they're still worth seeing. So we're going to take a little trip down memory lane to use that cliche we're going to take a look at some videos that we've made in the past and had some of the staff pick out segments of longer videos that they liked all right i'll show you how it works here we're going to start with our swedenborg minute series uh, we used to every week put out a minute long you know with the intro and stuff it was a minute 20 uh video called swedenborg minute where we would take one topic and we would talk about it quickly and concisely enough that you could get something across in just a minute. I'm gonna be, so I'm not going to need to explain it a ton because we can just watch it right now, okay? This was one in the series that was called True Freedom. So here it is. What is freedom? Some would say that total freedom is being able to do anything I want. Seems fair at the beginning, but wait a minute. Look at this I want. This is ceding total control to this mechanism of what I want. But what is this want? We don't even always want what we want. People will do something and then later say, oh no, I didn't want to do that. But they did it because back then they did want to do it. The wants are at war. There's things people want and they wish they didn't want. People completely sabotage their own lives by going with what they think they want. Is this want even a friend of ours at all? Seems like a pretty shady character. Swedenborg wrote that doing whatever you want isn't being free because you're completely under the control of your cravings. True freedom is, at first, a lot of work. By taming our cravings, resisting our negative tendencies, and having what's loving, true, and universal take precedence, we can begin the process of overhauling ourselves and fostering the growth of desires for what's compassionate for everyone and what's truly healthy for ourselves. Once those become what we want, we can follow them in true freedom. That one you could see, we had that timer in the corner there, it ran just a little over. Sometimes you couldn't even get the whole thing out in 60 seconds. But the effort was to try to communicate concepts clearly and quickly, because that, that concept there about the nature of freedom, that comes from a big synthesis of a lot of Swedenborg's writings. You wouldn't get that initially opening the pages, but that is a clear, understandable idea, and you pull that from Swedenborg. Part of what this channel is trying to do is show, hey, you, if you can get past some of the wording of things or that it's a lot to read, there's stuff like that in there, which I feel like is pretty pretty practical, right? And so there's that kind of thing that we did, but there's also this show, the Monday Night Show, which probably a lot of you have seen, but that went through several evolutions as well before it got to its current state. And we want to go back to a discussion that I was having um, with Tom Rose, who was an ambulance chief operations officer. And he had, I had actually seen a talk by him long ago, I would say six years ago, something like that, uh, where he was describing this very peculiar, particular uh, set of conclusions that he had reached from all of his work with people who had gone through major traumas. And so we had this, ex this uh, conversation about that and about what he'd learned, and we wanted to bring that back up in case you hadn't seen it, because it pertains to some subjects that, that we all deal with, you know, death, dying, and, and the, the experience of it. So I'll let Tom uh, talk about it here. There's... I found that there's a question that I'd started asking people appropriately. I didn't ask everybody we treated on the ambulance, but sure. I mean, people I knew who went through something. And later I became a pastor and I was visiting people who were recovering from something. I would say, what do you remember of the worst of it when it was severe trauma? And yeah. there were only two answers to that question. In everyone that you talked to? Everyone I talked to. Yeah. There's only two answers. One was, I don't remember. Most people said, I don't remember. And very few say start telling you something else, like a spiritual experience, or you know I was near death experience, out of body, life review, or slow motion. But that's not what people saw. So yes. they're telling you something right. other than what everybody witnessed. And but no one could say what it felt like for a steering wheel to go through their chest. Because because you hadn't talked to anyone who was like, oh yeah, it was oh it was, it was just like, exactly yeah. like this. No, they're 
there are some they are describing something else yeah so that, that brings it let's bring up the next swedenborg quote which which seems very the light of reason is overshadowed by our mistaken ideas which arise because we trust what our outer physical senses tell us and so I, I just put, wanted to pull that one in because I thought of when you're talking about, okay, we people, first responders, other people who are around see this, what looks like horrific suffering. You know, even even someone can be responding and, and, and screaming or something. You think, oh, this, this person must be in unimaginable suffering. But when you're interviewing these people uh, consistently, they're saying, no, I mean, I wasn't there. That's my experience. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the consistent answer seems to be, I don't remember what happened. And I'm not going to be a person who tries to take them through it. Well, tell me, you know, think about it. Try harder. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm just going to accept their answer. They didn't consciously experience what happened. At least subsequently, they don't think they did. They don't can't tell me about it. Yeah. Or this other experience. Yeah. And so that uh, that brings us up to our our second topic for for discussion, which I labeled the hurricane theory, which is something that I, I came across through you. But the idea that that if if really in trauma these kinds of of horrific experiences the person who's going through them uh isn't some isn't there either yeah they just don't remember it or or they had some kind of spiritual experience and you just go go to any near-death experience and they say oh i was i was floating above you know or i felt a sense of peace a sense of light that kind of thing so if they're not there obviously there is damage being done but the hurricane theory if you want to talk about it a bit is the idea that the real uh, suffering is happening not with the person, but with those th- who care about the person. So my th- theory around this severe, you know, swirling storm of tr- severe trauma, mm. the hurricane thing, is, yeah, emotional trauma, emotional suffering seems to me to be more intense around the what we would call the victim of trauma. Uh, I like to say the subject of the trauma, but we don't have that in our vocabulary. We say sure. the victim of trauma. So the person in the middle is in this curious calm that we talked about. Yeah. Well, well, what, you know, and a lot of so, people will, after they've had their near-death experience or some kind of traumatic experience, will say, I no longer fear the dying process. That often happens. Yeah. And yet, there's, you know, there is, something happened. They went through severe trauma. They yeah. might have lost a leg. I mean, something happened. There's a, there's a storm. Yes. Something happened. But they're in this place in the middle that's curiously calm. Mm-hmm. And the people around, especially closest to them, are in the swirl of emotion around it, and they're picturing, you know, mom heard about the accident, and was, or brother heard about it, was was going to be the one that picked him up and, and didn't, and someone else did, and they thought, if only I'd been there. Oh, yes. And they're going through all these, inc- right. so many I could tell you, but emotional anguish over, oh, I wish, I'd, and, and, you know, that, what could I have done? But also they're picturing what they went through. So how could anybody suffer that kind of pain? A steering wheel through yeah. your chest. I, how could God permit such suffering? But they just have to ask their loved one. What's it? Oh, you must have suffered so. And, you know, and they're starting to get that everybody else is so upset around them. And they're, yeah, they're upset. Their life has changed. Something's happened. And they, but yeah. they're, you know, now they're almost having to caretake all their loved ones who are so... They're picturing what they went through, and they didn't experience that. Yeah, I think that people will report, you know, once you're in the hospital, pain can come back. You know, obviously you have yeah, a recovery period, right. but but as you're, to your point, you know, the, the actual event itself that's causing all this anguish in everyone, the the moment itself, yeah, that they were they were in some kind of uh, yeah, some kind of eye, you know, they were in some kind of curious calm, and the, yeah. But the swirly stuff around it, even busyness around it, you can picture lots of things being the, the wind. All the people caring for them, that's yes. all normal. But all this, this swirl of emotion around it, and the reason I want to talk about this is, I mean, when they wake up in the hospital and say, you know, they see, they might wake up and see mom in the chair in the corner weeping. Yeah. And they wake up and say, what happened? Right. And, you know, that's, a, I think, a cue for mom to go, Maybe they don't, they don't, you know, I'm picturing stuff that didn't happen. And I also feel as though, and so, well, therefore, people who are around someone who went through severe trauma, I encourage them to think like this. They didn't experience quite what we think they did. Let's stop picturing that. Let's stop Mm. going back and saying, oh, that must have been, and then picture all these things. Let's just be where they are now and help them move forward. So it's a whole different way to look at that kind of situation. And I wanted to put that one in there because even, so on this channel, we talk about life after death, that kind of thing. The idea that 
uh, the death of the body is just a transition into the next life. Even people who believe that really strongly, I'll still get comments about that. Uh, I still fear the dying process. People will say, "Is it gonna? Is it gonna hurt? What's gonna happen?" So Tom's uh, experiences or his um, the what he's gathered from talking to all these people is particularly fascinating because it seems that actually the stuff we fear the most, you don't really feel it. It doesn't really happen. That, and it's also a, a new way to look at the whole situation. That that actually, in some ways, the people going through the most trauma are those that care about the person who's been harmed. So I feel like that was interesting. And actually, later in that same episode, this was an old episode of Sweden Morgan Life. Does it hurt to die? Tom Rose talked about his own near-death experience that he'd had. So I wanted to share that clip with you too. Called this a first-person account because I I remember you talking about that that you know long before you'd gotten into any of this there was you had sort of this this peak in and i had a little swedenborg quote to kick it off which is um i was enabled to feel this is from his same report of his own experience i was enabled to perceive and even feel that there was a pull a kind of drawing out of the deeper levels of my mind and therefore of my spirit from my body and this is what we've been talking about the whole time that the body is what's going through these traumas that the spirit is something else so i was wondering if you would be willing to talk us through a little bit what happened to you so what happened to me i was 14 years old at uh, at midnight at a lake with my two friends kevin and edward and they were swimming i wasn't a swimmer yeah and i had learned something about swimming so i decided when they came up on on the rocks of the rocky shoreline i decided to show off we're 14. yeah uh, I like an idiot to dive in the water and show them what i could do and I swam pretty well, but I got out to a certain point, couldn't turn around, whatever was happening, and I went down. And it's still, it's the most helpless feeling I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. I'm sinking down, it's dark, I hate water, and my mind is calling out to God, help me, I'm just totally helpless. At a certain point, they realized what was happening, came in after me Mm -hmm. to get me. From beginning to end, for my friends, that was a serious traumatic event, an right. emotional, an emergency. They came in, they ended up saving my life, getting me on shore. I ended up coughing up water. We're lying there silent for a half an hour. But for me, at a certain point, all of a sudden I was watching a movie of my life. It's, today it's called a life review. Right. And so this was a, this was a long time ago. This, this was, before, I was fourteen. It's nineteen sixty-seven. Before Raymond Moody or any of that. It's you eight years before. Raymond Moody published Life After Life, Mm -hmm. where, so for those eight years, I'm thinking nobody else has experienced this. So I didn't talk about it to anybody. Right, right. Until I started reading, other people have experienced this. But, you know, I I was watching a feature-length movie of my life, all peaceful scenes of my life, wonderful feature-length movie, uh, peace, 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 peace. And then I was suddenly above the lake, 30 feet up where the cabins were, it's midnight, it's chilly, I'm see, I see the people in the cabin, I'm, hello, I see my uncle, you know, my, who I called uncle, yeah. oh, trying to get their attention about what's happening, it's a very real experience to me. Sensory, like tactile. And that's moment. called an out-of-body experience, so I didn't have the full NDE, but I had this life review, and I had this, this out-of-body, and I was totally, as far as I was concerned, that's where I was, trying to get their attention, and then I was coughing up water on the shore. And, uh, you know, from then on, 14 years old on, I realized our life is not just this. There's some other thing going on. There's another level of consciousness. And I, you know, as I said, my friends had a traumatic, horrific experience from beginning to end. If you had interviewed me right then, I would have told you, well, I had something scary and traumatic and then a wonderful, peaceful experience. Yeah. And if you <laughs> it turned kept, out to be a pretty good you know, it was like It was yeah. like the most peaceful thing I've ever felt. Yeah. And if you kept talking to me and looked upset about what happened, I would have tried to comfort you and say, it's okay, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> because I just knew that then. Yeah. All right, so that's cool, just to see somebody describe their experience. You can tell somebody this is not theoretical for him. This is, it's really happened. This is what it's like to go through that. And he has a message that, hey, it's not always what you think it is. And from that, we can learn to, to act in the most optimal kind of ways surrounding that. So I think it's cool to see people describe their experiences. I was glad to have him uh, be willing to do that with us. So 
let's go back in time a little bit. Uh, we were talking with, with Tom about an experience that happened in his childhood. Now we're going to move into the childhood of the YouTube Off the Left Eye channel. This video, your brain is spamming you. This is when we were first trying to um, get Swedenborg out into the web. You know, we'd only made a few videos, and I didn't know, nobody really knew who Swedenborg was as far as I was concerned, so how do you get people interested in something like this? So I thought, let's take a concept that's applicable and, and put it in a way so that it reminds people of other things they deal with in life. And this is still one of my favorite concepts of Swedenborg's that we've had in different sort of iterations, but this was the first one. So take a look and, and take it to heart because I think it's a really important message. Here it is. My feet look stupid. Bam, there, you just did it. You had a thought. You just got a message in your head. No big deal, we get messages all the time. How can one person handle that much input? How do we survive it? Easy, we survive by filtering. Air duct repair newsletter, I don't gotta open that. Forwarded message, oh, cheap prescriptions. Oh, thanks bro. Or we take cues from the packaging based on what we just know about stuff. Ah, awkward language, unlikely story. I've heard a few times about a prince that wants to give me money. This is not something I need to give my credit card number to. Or we know the people that it comes from. Ah, that's my friend Jane. She tends to go right to catastrophe. So whatever she's about to say is probably about half as bad as it sounds. Hmm. I'll just see if they leave a message. Yep, junk mail. We absolutely couldn't survive without filtering the messages that we get. Think if we had no filter. Wait, what? A special offer just for me? Whoa, I can't believe it. Someone at the company knows my name. Look at these benefits. This must be a great offer. Sign me up. But no, we know it's not a good deal. It's a generic offer for a credit card, which at 20% interest is just kind of like getting robbed. But we dodge that whole mess because we filter out the message. We filter all our messages in all the places we get them, except here. When we get messages delivered here, like we do all day. Nobody likes my ideas. I'm just not really good at that. I'm not really good at anything. I've made all the wrong choices. We don't filter. We think it's all me. If we did that with every external message we got, if we trusted and believed it, we'd shut down. We'd be at the mercy of anyone who wants to sell us anything, extort money from us, or give us a bogus picture of us in our relationships. So let's not do that inside. But our inside might not be as inside as we think it is. According to Roger Nelson and co, our collective brains can begin to spike random number generators hours before massive events like 9-11 even begin. Michael Persinger's research indicates that we may be smearing each other with our thoughts across the Earth's electromagnetic field. And two and a half centuries ago, Emanuel Swedenborg was plugged in enough to recite the nuances of the Stockholm fire 250 miles away as it happens. He said that our brains are like a radio antenna, pulling input from more places than you would ever believe. Take what you want to, but maybe our brains aren't like a computer, synthesizing our thoughts and feelings based on our own data with our own motives. They're an inbox. This is not a joke. Some of the brain spam that we get is just annoying, but some of it is vicious. And it's hard to figure out. We can't see who's giving the messages we get. We can't go to their website and figure out their mission statement. But we can learn to filter. We can develop a basic intelligence about the packaging ideas come in and how we react. I can just leave you with these thoughts. Worry about the future, worry about the way things will turn out for you, anything that destroys hope, or anger, fear, jealousy, any kind of self-hatred. In my experience, if an idea comes into your head charged with that stuff, it's like the plastic window on an envelope. It's like a generic greeting or your name misspelled. It's how you can tell, man. It's junk mail. Man, that's that makes me smile. That's memory lane right there. That's okay. So there's an old movie. It wasn't that 
well, it's got to be like three years ago or something, but it feels like forever ago. But that was it. That was how we were trying to reach the world. I still, as I said, think that that's a great message to get from Swedenborg. And again, you're not going to get that message out of Swedenborg when you first open it up. But if you let the worldview sink in, you begin to gain leverage on those kinds of things. So that's why I wanted to share that with you. Let's move back to the Swedenborg and Life show. This was again from sort of the second phase of the show where we would have guests come in and we'd discuss different topics. In this one, uh, we called it the future of religion. And um, I was talking with Reverend Anna Wuffenden, who's a Swedenborgian minister, and we were talking about the importance of having love and truth together, which is a huge, uh, it's a pillar, really, of Swedenborg's theology. And to say a little more about what that means, here's us chatting in front of this table. All about, if, you, if you guys crack open Swedenborg at any point, you'll always see this duality, love and wisdom, uh, good and truth, um, faith, uh, you know, anyway. Faith and charity. Faith and charity, yep. right, exactly. Um, we just made a little music video about that, how, that, how often that comes up. And, um, and so you'll sort of see that um, for him, it's kind of the sweet spot when the two come together. Absolutely. And so if you have these religious concepts, like, you know, this idea of God, okay, there is a uh, higher power, you know, but goodness and truth, uh, the ability to, to genuinely love people, all that, it comes into me, you know, as a gift. If you can understand that and believe that and act lovingly from it, that's like the sweet spot. You know, Absolutely. The, you know the, the concept is nice to have or, or acting lovingly nice to have, but once you have these two, then you the ceiling kind of goes away. You can really get deeper and deeper in and kind of walking through, for me, walking through Swedenborg and picking up all these little factoids and the, the new, I, I, every show I say the word nuance. It's one of my like most fancy vocabulary words. All these little nuances of the the spirituality he describes the spiritual reality he describes um they kind of give you this way to navigate um but really it's about making sure that you are being loving while you're using those concepts yeah absolutely i mean one of the things that we talk a lot about is it's not to not have those guiding principles i mean so for example at our church we are kind of redefining what worship is and kind of blurring mm -hmm. the lines and broadening it. And we always work together and worship together and eat together. And so we have what you might typically think of as like a church experience with singing and praying and and the songs and mm -hmm. and uh, sermons. And that's really key because that informs. But we're also like working side by side and then we're sharing in this meal. And I think what happens is just what you're describing is you start to see those sweet spots. Like as you're like looking at this little plant and thinking about like kind of the physicality of the usefulness that it might feed somebody yeah there's like a spiritual principle in there and then you can talk about like how does that apply to your life and and that's just one of the beautiful things that i find in swedenborg's works is it's always on multiple layers like yeah. the, the truth applies on you know the literal level but also on these deeper levels these higher spiritual levels and that willingness to like keep doing that cycle and that mm -hmm. up and down piece um, I think keeps that alive and you can find those sweet spots. You can find the places where it can come together and then blossom and bloom. Yeah. Garden analogies, I just, they're all over the place. We're, we're, and that <laughs> won't be the last one we use tonight. And it makes me think, yeah, well, you know, we, we do this correspondences meditation every week and the idea that you can be working with something physical like a plant, but from that, from noticing how it works, you can learn these sort of spiritual truths about life. And so, yeah, I know that people who... You know that religion has this gathering element to it, and the people who are that I've talked to who are don't like religion or even anything spiritual still say, "Ooh, that there's good community there." Like that's hard to to duplicate that yeah. community. So, how do we? And we'll be looking more as we go on with this conversation. But yeah, how do you get the good stuff and not the bad stuff? So, and that's something like I'm really interested in. Where does religion go from here? What does it look like? Does it look the same as it? I mean, where, where is it going to be in 50, 100 years? So if you want to watch the whole version of any of these, we got the links in the description of this video. Uh, take, a, take a look. There's, you know, obviously there's a lot on either side of any of them. All right. So there's that one. Let's move on to uh, the purpose of spiritual struggles. This was another episode of Swedenborg in Life. I was talking to a psychologist, Dr. Sony Werner, um, and we were talking a little bit about the, the purpose of struggles and also this idea of a house being like a mine. So here's a little clip from that episode. Another metaphor that Swedenborg talks about is think of a three-story house. Mm 
and we're mostly living in the middle level right. and that's where we uh, I'm thinking about when it was describing how what we love so think about how you decorate your house and you have these wonderful places to eat and entertain people and you just love your home but there's an attic and there's a basement and up in the attic is a metaphor for the Lord and the angels so I almost picture these stairs coming down and if we open the door to the attic they can come in but also right. coming up from the basement or almost like these infestations and you know the snakes and <laughs> and they're ruining your home my basement. <laughs> <laughs> I like salamander uh, so yeah. just think of these horrible and they sneak in and they try to sneak in it's almost like they have a camouflage and so you're convinced that that you that they should be there yeah but you have to really identify what they are and the influence from from the heavens or above us can really help us go that is a love of self. That is just getting too attached to our worldly possessions. That's me wanting to be smarter than all my other friends and, and thinking I'm somehow superior. And we need to name those things, and then hopefully we'll get closer to goodness. Right, because if, if there's not any kind of crisis, you never have to look at everything. You never have to bring it all up. And I, I want to point out that, yeah, it's this complex experience, the thing he's actually talking about. You mentioned, you know, William James... Uh, uh, not knowing what he was going through, not understanding it. And in the beginning, Swedenborg talking in this number about uh, hell attacks, what you love. And, and it's just this confusing thing. And I had to leave out a million passages where he talks about <laughs> you're brought to despair. And yes. then that's when, you, right. that's when you first understand there's a higher power that I, I need help right. from. And this is not so that God is like, told you. No. <laughs> no. This is because that recognition is an essential step towards the heavenly mindset. You, you'll never get there unless you really experience it. If you hear it, like, oh, yeah, um, I guess I need that stuff. But if you if you feel it, if you know, like, wow, I'm, I'm, I can control things now, but I couldn't before, you know there's a, an outside sort of influence. And the guy on the far end that was over here is Dr. Dan Sinisfet. And he's got great stuff to say. We didn't get a chance to get in in that clip, but we did an episode called How to Be Wise that he was on, and he was on another one, I think, too. So check him out sometime soon as well. All right, so let's move away from Swedenborg in life to one of our shorter videos. This one um, is called The Universal Categories of Love, and that title is actually taken directly out of something in Swedenborg. I think it's true Christianity. He, he entitles a section The Universal Categories of Love. And this was, yeah, when we were doing sort of mid-format. It wasn't a whole hour. It wasn't just a minute. But we were trying to get out just just really pertinent pieces of information in a longer format. I think this is, I believe this is our second most popular video on the channel right now. Uh, so worth taking a look at. But you, even though, even still, you may not have seen it. And it's it's taking a concept that initially seems a little bit arcane, uh, the categories of love. But I think is really uh, has a really practical application. And hopefully we can communicate that through this video. So here's the universal categories of love. If I was going to have a really healthy day, it would be about prioritizing the types of love. There are three universal categories of love or of motivation that drive people. And it might not seem intuitive to label them this way, but work with me for a minute. The fundamental categories are love of usefulness, love of the world, and love of the self. The way we interact with them and the way they're prioritized in us dictates everything. But to really believe that, you've got to meet them first. So yeah, I'm mowing the lawn, but check it. I'm using one of those no pollution real mowers. So there it is, an action. But what's the essence of this action? What's the love that drives it? Which category is it? Well, that all depends on why I'm doing it. I might be doing it so that I look good. I want people to notice that I'm doing something good for the planet. I want to be part of a superior, eco-conscious, hip, cutting-edge group of people that are like so much more enlightened than the rest of the country and are the real heroes in the great struggle for blah, 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 blah. Everybody, meet love of the self. As the name implies, I have love of the self when I'd give anything for the cause of me. My number one priority is to benefit the self, whether it's about increasing its reputation, popularity, raising its official or unofficial status, power, influence. I'm the first and last thing on my mind, the apple of my own eye. But let's back up. It could be that I'm not mowing for those reasons at all. It might be that I'm here doing this, but I'm not really thinking about this green mower or this green grass, but something else that's green. Love of the world isn't just the love of money. At its essence, it's also the love of pleasure. 
if that makes sense. Things that are visually pleasing, pleasing to the ear, pleasing to the palate, and all other kinds of intense, expensive, decadent stuff. When love of the world is in charge, that stuff is the goal, the highest good. Life is about creature comforts, about seeking out sensory experiences of whatever kind floats your boat, or just hoarding cash. Maybe I have an eco-mo business, not because I care about the planet, but because I know that other people do, and I know I can exploit that to get some coin. If a better way to make more money came up, man, I ditched this so fast. So there it is, love of the world. Not so bad, but not so good either. Not really satisfied, living for future gratification. Meh. But don't we deserve a little bit more? I mean, can't this simple act, this little part of routine, really be something transcendent, something inspiring, a genuinely healthy action? Yeah, it can. And not because I'm having some mystical experience while I do it, not because I do it exceptionally fast or well, but because, put mundanely enough, I want to do this because it's good. Because of the good this does for the world. I'm not loving how it makes me look, I'm not loving what it gets for me, but I've kept a little bit of crud out of the atmosphere. And so here a little kid takes a breath of fresh air that's good for their lungs, and I'm loving that. People can sit in peace on their patio, and I'm loving that. Oil doesn't leak into the water supply so someone can drink and not carry toxins around with them, and I'm loving that. I'm loving the work and the health for my body so I can help others. I love the lawn space I'm creating for the kids and the dogs and the people that will play in it. The feelings they'll get out of it. I may not even meet some of these people, and they'll probably never draw the connection between these two events, but I know. I know the good this will do, and I'm holding that in my mind. The healthy kid, the clean water, the place to play. I know the function of this activity, its service to the common good, its use, and that's what it is to love usefulness. This is the sweet spot. That's high quality fuel for a mind. Now if you're like me, you're jumping around between these three types of motivation all the time, usually without even realizing it. It's not that these other two types are evil, and you've got to get rid of them and never talk to them again. Like I said before, it's all about priorities. We're all born with these three types of love inside us, but who's going to end up in charge? There are three basic vacancies in us. Let's call them the head, the body, and the feet. The head's in charge, it calls the shots, it sees and decides the course, the body responds and moves, and the feet just do what everyone tells them to. If love of the self takes the head, then I'm running for governor because I want to be governor. I want that title, I want that praise, I want that recognition. Getting kickbacks from lobbyists and the salary won't be that bad either. And as for the purpose of the position, the legislation, society at large, the problems people are having and how I can help, the suffering I can prevent, oh yeah, yeah, I mean it's good to do some of that stuff to get the people's affection. It's a good vehicle to get me where I want to go. But if love of the world is up top, then who cares how I look? This whole company exists to make me money. I'll fabricate profits to drive my stock up, I'll exploit loopholes, I'll cheat people out of their retirement money. Obviously, these two combinations don't work out well, for me or for the rest of the world. But if these three forces end up in the order they were meant to be in, the order that makes us healthy and human, that I'm doing my job in integrity for the good of the world, where I'm making my little donation to Habitat for Humanity because I'm thinking about what it feels like to have somewhere to live, the joy of having a clean, safe space for the most important things in your life. The tax break is cool, but it's not a deal breaker if it doesn't work out. If nobody notices, okay. If someone does, well, who doesn't like to be appreciated? And under the umbrella of loving usefulness, the other two can be in tune, laid back. I'm not trying to lecture you about it. I'm not just trying to say, don't be bad, be good. Everyone knows that already. But for me, being aware of the categories and cognizant of which one I'm operating from is like being given the way out of a maze. If I'm mowing for the first two reasons, yeah, what's growing in the yard ends up the same, but what's growing in me, it's night and day. Watch the way anxiety and tension follow these first two. I would never realize, oh, it's not about figuring out the minutia of trying to be seen as exactly the person I want to be seen as, or being surrounded with just the things I want to be surrounded by, which always seems like I'm getting close, but never quite satisfied. This shows me, dude, it's a trap. You're on the whole wrong freeway universal categories of love. I'm just trying to pass them along for you if you want them, and just trying to order them correctly in myself whenever I can. Like, just as an example, let's say I was making a video about the universal categories of love. Would I just do it to make myself look good? Okay, so what I want you to do is just like make me look really cool. That's impossible. Well then just like make everything else look bad so that I look really good. Or do I do it with love of the world on top?
Okay, so it says here that people are more likely to donate if uh, just just put in some violin music and like a please donate button. Or am I doing it for the sake of the information to get helpful things out? Simply because you and I are probably going through some of the same struggles, and maybe with the right tools we can make some progress. And if I did make a video like that, would I try to make it look like I thought it all up myself, or would I mention Swedenborg and his essay on the three universal categories of love? Oh, I don't know. This is getting a little too hypothetical, don't you think? There's a lot of Easter eggs in that one. Let's see if I can... So, Matt's in that one, who made all the graphics for it. Uh, and also, there's a scene where, I don't know if you remember in the beginning, there's a, like, I'm mowing the lawn, and and um, uh, there's those people that come up and are like, hey, what's up, man? That took a lot of takes, because the idea of um, people thinking it was cool that I was mowing the lawn <laughs> with a real mower... Um, was so ridiculous and that he would like put his sunglasses up like wow cool man that that took a lot of takes because that was rough uh another easter egg the guy who did that is the guy who composed a lot of the music that you hear on the show okay great so that's the categories of love uh and yeah check out swedenborg's true christianity if you want to read his essay on it Let's go back to Swedenborg and life, this show. Um, this was a show that called What Does Prayer Do? And this is a little segment with Peter Rhodes, who was actually, Peter Rhodes, I think, was the first non-me we had on this channel. Uh, we had a series called Conversations, where it was just he and I hanging out. He's got this really cool setup um, where where there, you, you, people can hang out and, and talk, and we were in one of his huts, um, and we were talking about stuff. Anyway, that's not the clip I'm going to show you now, but just saying, he was first to make it onto this channel just because I like how he talks about things. So, this was an episode about what does prayer do, and this is him talking a little bit about the nature of prayer and some of his experience with the 12-step program. So, here you go. As he's talking, this is jumping right in the middle of something he's talking about, praying. The prayer is to be a request that the Lord may have mercy on us, give us the power to resist the evils that we have repented of, and provide us an inclination and a desire to do what is good. So look at the kind of things that he's asking for there. That, that's a little bit different than a, a Mercedes, right, Pete? Yeah. Uh, being a person in recovery... We have a lot of prayers, mm -hmm. and basically it starts out with a recognition that we're powerless over whatever our addiction is. There's a higher power, and the mm -hmm. third step is to surrender to Him. And then ask for His help to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Stay away from alcohol or whatever it is. So there is a turning to God who has the power to do what you can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, I also include, and it's often, often included in the prayers, but not my will, thy will be done. Mm -hmm. Even if that means you have to continue to drink for a while to get the real message you need, I'm not telling God, uh, you know, help me not drink, as if he didn't know what I really yeah. need in relation to my problem? addiction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh, so, so, so <laughs> shocked. Uh, so it's much more opening me to God and my recognition that he has the power uh, yeah. to do that. So it's really not only open my heart, but also in humility asking for that help, but not asking for the help if that's not his will. So that was, that. I just love it when whenever Peter says stuff. We got a lot of, more of him on the channel if you want to hear more. That was the previous incarnation of the Swedenborg and Life show. It was a certain point at which we changed from that format where it was generally like a loose discussion and, and I had a guest in to the current format of the show where it's like we're taking you through an idea piece by piece because we just thought we got to get Swedenborg's ideas are, are interesting and fun and, and you really got to be able to plan things out to take someone all the way through them. So that's the current iteration of the show. This episode, What God Looks Like, was the first of what we would call show 3.0. Um, and we want to show you the intro from this one, just the beginning segment, which was, this was, we had had a week to prepare it, and we were just going to make this big transition into it. Uh, and this is also cool because it has a blooper right at the very beginning because we couldn't get the thing to work right away. So this is how the current format of the show began. I assume if you've clicked on this, you're thinking to yourself, who do these people think they are? They're not even ready for their own show to start, and they have the audacity to say that they know something about God, and also that they're going to give me specifics on what God looks like. This is going to be a train wreck. Well, you asked for it, so here it is. God looks like this. But actually, God only looks like that if you close your left eye. 
If you close your right eye, God looks like this. Simultaneously, God looks like and is this. However, the following is also an accurate depiction of God. So after that, you might be thinking, oh, well, the title was clickbait. Now, you said you were going to show what God looks like, then you just showed a bunch of stuff. This show is going to be a cop-out. Well, I can't assure you that it won't, but if it is, at least it will be a really in-depth, complex, and hopefully interesting cop-out. So it didn't quite show the blooper. When I came in, it was saying, oh, they, they're not even ready for their own show to start. If you go to the real video, what God looks like, because we cut it off for this episode, you can see me first going, like not saying anything. Um, so there, there's that. There's, another, there's some more homework. Go check out that one. All right. So next video in our queue is going to be a song. Uh, this is one. Actually, earlier, I think it was in the episode um the future of religion that we showed a clip from with reverend anna wovenden i said we just recorded a music video about love and wisdom and how for this was that man so this is like self-referential stuff here so this came out about the same time as that and this was one of only two videos that are songs that we put out and this is trying to get you know as we've said a million times love and wisdom or good and truth this great duality is like everywhere in Swedenborg. So we tried to kind of lay it out simply and with music so it would be super palatable. So hopefully you think it is. Here's our, our entry into spirit tunes. There are two basic elements that everything else came from. You could call one love and let's call the other wisdom. Amor sapientia if that works better for you. Or substance and form, or the good and the true. They initially emanate together, creating the shape of peace in the human mind But if we block them out, we become hostile to our own kind We all know what that leads to We've all seen what that leads to Everything, everything's about getting things back together Everything, everything's about getting things back together so these two great forces push out, but we each receive them differently. See, there's potential for conjunction, not that we have them incompletely. But where these two are two, they would rather be one. And when they do, we get to start the whole thing over when it's done. Everything, everything's about getting things back together. Everything, everything's about getting things back together. There are two basic units of consciousness that exist or can never be There is the infinite, divine, and finite stuff like you and me We do not do well when we're cut off from the source And the source would love to reconnect, but the source can't use force Some people would love to connect too, but love can't do it by itself Let's take that stuff I said in verse 1 back off the shelf Wisdom is knowing how and doing, and with both you're a reflection You become a conduit for the source, which is the source of that connection you get it? Everything, everything's about getting things back together. Everything, everything's about getting things back together. That's, that's the tune. Okay, so that's going to be the end of the videos we're showing you tonight. However, there's other videos you can go look at on your own anytime. Oh, I still got it. Oh, yeah. It's hard for me. This is mirrored, so it's hard for me to point at things on the screen. This is our other song video. It's called Religion Means Nothing If You're Still a Jerk. This is a Swedenborg in Life episode called The Purpose of Creation from back in the day. And then this is another Swedenborg Minute. Does God want us to dominate nature so endless watching fun for you guys really appreciate you as an audience because you make it so this channel has been able to continue and go forward so we get to make videos and then eventually look back on the videos that we make and all that other great stuff so 
This has been fun for me. Hopefully been fun for you. We're going to be back next week with a brand new episode where we're going to be asking, is the devil real? So if you think you can handle something spooky like that, join us next Monday, next Monday, next Monday, same time. I looked at the mic like, what, what was that? Same time, same place. Thank you guys again so much and hope you have a great week.